Let's pray. Father, thank you that you've allowed us to gather here together as your body, your son's bride. I ask that you would bless our time together. May your Holy Spirit affect us greatly through the proclamation of your word. I ask that you would be with me as I bring your word to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. If you will, for the honor of the reading of God's word, if you would stand, if you're physically able, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to be in verses 16 through 21. Last Sunday night, I preached on the previous passage, which was 12 through 15. We're going to continue that tonight, go 16 through 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. It says, I say again, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly, in this confidence of boasting, seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise, for ye suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face, I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit, whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. You guys can have a seat. Praise God for the reading of his word. This little paragraph here, these few verses, it's about tolerating heretics. That's not something that we, as the bride of Christ, should be doing, tolerating heretics. But it happens. Sometimes we just want to get along. Sometimes we don't want to make waves. There's all kinds of different reasons for us not wanting to rock the boat. Sometimes it's self-preservation. Sometimes it's pride. Sometimes it's thinking, well, maybe I don't know it all. Maybe I'm not qualified to make that call about who's a heretic and who's not. Well, we talked a lot about that last Sunday night, if you were here. I want to read that little section really quickly, just a few verses here. Verse 12, if we're backing up, it says, But what I'm doing, I will continue to do, this is in the New American Standard, so that I may cut off opportunity from those who desire an opportunity, to be regarded just as we are in the matter about which they are boasting. For such men are false apostles, and David remembers that Greek word we talked about last week, pseudopostolos, deceitful workers disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. So that's the context in which we're looking at today's passage. The context is these wolves had come in, these pseudo-apostolos, those false apostles, false apostles, false brethren. They had come in. Martin Lloyd-Jones, if you've ever heard of him, he was a physician turned preacher. Preached in London for many years. He was a Welshman. Um, the tragedy, is what he said, the tragedy, remember that word, tragedy, of the present hour is that the church has tolerated the heretics. Charles Spurgeon, many years before that, went through what was called the downgrade controversy. The churches in the Baptist Union in London, they were putting up with heresy. They were minimizing doctrine. And Spurgeon stood on the word of God. And even though he lost many friends, he stood on the word of God. Even if he stood alone with God, he was in the majority. Remember that. Paul here, 
he decides, hey, Corinth, if you're going to tolerate these heretics, I'm going to talk to you like they were talking to me. I am going to show you your foolishness because you have listened to these fools, so I'm going to sound like a fool. And this sermon is probably going to have the word fool in it more than any sermon I have ever preached in my life. I want you to see your foolishness, Corinth. Corinth, you put up with these fools, so I'm going to act like a fool. Answer a fool according to his folly, so he will not be wise in his own eyes. That's Proverbs 26.5. Do we tolerate heretics in the name of peace? Do we tolerate heretics in the name of not making waves? Do we tolerate heretics in the name of keeping the status quo? Everything's going good right now, guys. We don't want to make waves. We don't want to rock the boat do we everything's going good is it a true good or is it a false good is it just seeming to be good because we're all just floating through life or is it really good because we're standing on the word of God we have a much higher calling than just keeping the status quo we are called to do all to the glory of God. Let's get back to our text. Verse 16 says, And again I say, Let no one think me foolish, but if you do, receive me even as foolish, so that I also may boast a little. And Paul's saying, Don't think of me like a fool, except for the fact that you have received these fools, you have received these false apostles coming in who are fools and you've shown how foolish you are so let me act like a fool so that you'll actually listen to me because you've been listening to the fools remember last Sunday night we talked about this I want to read verse 13 again for such men are false apostles deceitful workers disguising themselves as apostles of Christ these guys Corinth was tolerating were false brothers. They were fools speaking to them foolishly. They were liars. They were deceitful workers. They were disguising themselves. They were making themselves appear to be something that they were not. And what did Corinth do? They drank it up. They ate every last bite. They picked up all the crumbs and took those in too. And they said, no, Paul, yeah, they've been talking negative stuff about you and we're believing it we're eating it up they're coming in these guys have a new word they got a fresh word well let me tell you if somebody has a fresh word it's not from the bible because the canon is complete that's what hebrews chapter one says it says in times past god spoke to us through dreams and through prophets but now what do we have? We have the word of God. He speaks to us through his word, through his son. And through his son, through the apostles of his son. How many apostles are alive today? We talked about that a little bit last week. How many people who are actually apostles are walking around today? We don't have any. When John died, the apostolic era ended. We also mentioned last week you can go online and purchase your own apostleship for $39.95. Go to whatever website and purchase your own apostleship. If you can purchase your apostleship, we're pretty sure you're not an apostle. Let's get back to our text. So, and again, I say, let no one think me foolish, but if you do, receive me even as foolish, so that I also may boast a little. Paul knows this is foolishness to boast. This, unless he's boasting in the Lord, as he had previously told us just a chapter or two earlier, that if we're going to boast, we need to boast in the Lord. But he's like, okay, you guys have listened to these guys boast about themselves, so I'm going to boast about myself to show you how silly that was and how dangerous it was. Let's go on verse 17. What I am saying, I am not saying as the Lord would, but as in foolishness, in this confidence of boasting. Now this verse right here, you could 
go back and forth all day long trying to understand, okay, it, it's, it's a conundrum. He says right there, I'm not speaking as the Lord, right? But it's in scripture, so it is the word of the Lord. So which is it? Is it not of the Lord or is it of the Lord? Well, yes and yes. Paul's saying, okay, I'm going to talk in a foolish way that is not in accordance with God because you've listened to things that are not in accordance with the word of God. You've tolerated this foolishness long enough. So to bring out that, I'm going to speak that way, but guess what? God, the Holy Spirit, inspired these words of Paul. So yes, it is speaking from the Lord, but not in a godly way, just to bring out their foolishness. We love to speak in sarcasm today. It's nothing new. Paul spoke in sarcasm. Elijah is probably the most sarcastic person we've ever read in scripture. What did he say to the 450 prophets of Baal? He said, is your God sleeping? Is your God relieving himself? That is sarcasm. Paul uses sarcasm here. He's saying, no, let nobody think me a fool. He said, but what I'm saying, I'm not saying as the Lord would, but in foolishness, I'm going to act foolish because you're tolerating them. In this confidence of boasting, I'm going to boast because you've been listening to boasting. I'm going to brag because you've been listening to bragging. I'm going to talk foolishly because you've been listening to foolish speech. He's mimicking these false apostles. Saying false apostles, all y'all do all day long is talk about yourselves. I'm going to do that a little bit here. I'm going to talk about how great I am just to show you Corinth how foolish you were in listening to them. He's mimicking them. But that's exactly what the Lord would have him to say. Why? Because all scripture is breathed out by God. Amen. This is blatant sarcasm used by Paul, but used by the Lord to expose the fool. That's what Paul has to do here. In Corinth, he's saying, Corinth, you've been tolerating the fools. I got to expose them. I got to show you who they really are. Back to the text, verse 18. It says, since many boast according to the flesh, I will boast also. I'm going to show you how silly it looks. Boasting according to the flesh, that's the way of the world. Amen. What's a telltale sign of a false prophet? He talks about himself more than the Lord Jesus Christ. But so many times it's not that easy to pick up. We got to know the difference in right and almost right. Not just the difference in plainly wrong. Bragging. That's the way it is now. I can hit a homer further than you can hit a homer, right? I can throw a football further than you can throw a football. I can make you tap out before you make me tap out. That's the way of the flesh who was the biggest boaster of all time, at least in our lifetimes? Probably Muhammad Ali, right? What Muhammad Ali? He was always saying, I'm the greatest. It's ridiculous. Amen. He's a clown. Muhammad Ali, right now, he professed to be a Muslim his entire adult life. If he didn't repent before he died, that clown is in hell right now. He was a caricature. He just played a role. Amen. He was bragging on himself. The greatest of all time. You're sitting in hell today, Muhammad. Why did Muhammad Ali talk this way? Why did he brag on himself? Because that's how the world works. That's the only thing lost people know to do. That's the only value he saw was in himself. Boasting in self, what does it do? It denies the satisfaction that we can have in Jesus Christ. Amen. It denies the satisfaction that we can have in the gospel. It denies the rest. When we're bragging, what are we doing? We're striving. 
when we're striving for the good favor of God, we're not resting in the fact that Christ has already earned that favor for us. When we're striving, when we're bragging, we're puffing out our chest, we're saying, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Instead of saying, I'm looking at you, Lord. I'm looking at you. I'm looking at your word and I'm seeing how great you are. I'm seeing that the Father chose a people before there was time. I'm seeing that the Son entered time, born of a virgin, living a perfect, sinless life, dying the death that you and I deserve on the cross. When I'm looking to the best thing, Christ, I'm seeing him. I'm not bragging on me. I'm not pu puffing my chest out. I'm not boasting in myself or what I have done. I'm going to boast in what he's done. I'm going to see that, yes, that sacrifice on that cross was accepted by the Father. How do we know? Because he rose on the third day. On that third day, he rose from the dead, showing that, yes, he was who he said he was. He was the sinless one, the perfect one, the second member of the Godhead wrapped on human flesh, lived the perfect life, raised on the third day, ascended, sitting right now at the right hand of the Father, ready to come back at the appointed time. When we're trusting in that, we won't have time to brag on ourselves. We won't live like Muhammad Ali when we're resting in Jesus Christ. When we're focused on him and his word, we won't have time to suffer fools. We'll know who the fool is. We talked last Sunday night a little bit about the two main types of heresies that were popping up. The early church, it was on who Christ was. Was he really God? Was he really man? Yeah, he's both. We talked about during Reformation times, the big heresies were how is someone saved? Soteriology. How is someone saved? By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That is the good news. There is no good news if I'm bragging on myself. If I'm pointing to me, I'm pointing to something that's wicked and dirty and tarnished and stained with sin. But when I look to Christ, I see the perfect one. Why would I look at me? When I can look at him. Amen. It's just like when I'm at home. Why would I look in a mirror when I can look at my beautiful wife? But I can look at Jesus Christ instead of looking at myself. I can fool myself into thinking I'm something great. We can all do that. We can all think, oh, well, I had perfect attendance in Sunday school this month. I bet that's a little check mark in heaven for me, right? Oh. I had, I handed out 32 gospel tracts last month. God's going to have another little check mark beside my name because I'm so wonderful. No, that's not how it works. There is an infinite number of check marks beside our name in heaven. Why? Because when the Father looks at us, if we're born again, we get credit for Christ. We all have an infinite number of check marks. What's infinity plus one? It's still infinity. We have the favor of the Father because of the Son, that imputed righteousness. Perfect righteousness doesn't get better. No, we do out of appreciation. Corinth, you're so smart, right? You're suffering these fools, Corinth. Why would you look to these people bragging on themselves. Verse 19. For you, Corinth, it says, for you being so wise, remember that sarcasm. That's a husband's favorite form of, <laughs> of, of literature, sarcasm. Favorite form of speaking, sarcasm. For you, being so wise, Corinth, tolerate the foolish gladly. 
You're doing it. You're eating it up, Corinth, right? You're drinking it down, Corinth. You're so smart, Corinth, right? You're so enlightened, Corinth. You are the ones. Remember earlier, Paul here talked about his stumbling speech. I am In verse 6, it says, For even if I am unskilled in speech, yet I am not so in knowledge. In fact, in every way we have made this evident to you in all things. Remember, there's the great possibility these false apostles were saying, no, Paul, you're, you're just some hillbilly hayseed down from the farm. You're not like these Greek enlightenment guys. You're not charging money for how much you're, for your talking. We know what you've got to say is worth nothing then, right? If you ain't charging, then you ain't worth listening to. That was the idea in Greek philosophy in those days. If you don't charge them, you ain't worth listening to. Paul, yeah, he might have been unskilled in speech. He didn't deny that. But it was the content of the message, not how slick the speech was. That was the value Corinth, you're so smart, right? Corinth, you're so enlightened, right? You're tolerating these fools, these false apostles. I must be speaking your language now, right, Corinth? Because why? I'm talking like the fools, so you must be eating up what I'm saying now, right? Because I'm sounding like those guys that were dragging you astray. You gladly tolerated them? Well, now you're going to tolerate me because I'm sounding just like them. That's what Paul's saying here in verse 19. You being so wise, you tolerate these fools gladly. You must love how I'm sounding right now. It's paining me, Paul is saying later on. It pains me to talk this way. It hurts me to the core. Why? Because my glory is in Jesus Christ. My glory is not in me. So what are the consequences of suffering these fools, of tolerating these fools? Well, we see it right here in verse 20. Verse 20 says, For you tolerate it if anyone enslaves you, anyone devours you, anyone takes advantage of you, anyone exalts himself, anyone hits you in the face. What are the consequences? Enslavement by the fools. It's so easy to do. The TV is loaded with these kind of false apostles. You turn on TBN or whatever, it's all a bunch of fools. These people are devouring Christians. Why? Because we don't know our Bible. We don't know what they're saying is foolishness because we're not actually reading and studying our Bibles. We don't know what the Word of God says so we can be sucked right in. That was Corinth. Corinth, you don't know what the word of God says. I taught it to you. I brought it to you. I was there, Paul says, when it all started, when the whole thing started, when Christianity began in Corinth, I was there, Paul said. You know the message I brought to you, and it's not what these false apostles are bringing you. No. What are you down? You're enslaved by these fools. You're held captive by a false gospel. Everyone is a slave. We are either slaves to sin or we are slaves of Christ. We are either in bondage to sin or we are in bondage to Christ. Only in Christ is the slave free. Amen. When enslaved to sin, there is no freedom. Let's keep going here. So, enslavement, devouring. Anyone devours you, devoured by fools. Wouldn't you love to have that on your tombstone? Devoured by fools. That's what happens. It may not be physically on a lot of tombstones, but the people who follow these false teachers that are around, it's easy to spot out a Joel Osteen as a false teacher. That's, that's no hard task. 
A three-year-old can spot out Joel Osteen as a false teacher. Pagans spot out him as a false teacher. But it's the ones who put just enough scripture in there, just enough truth. And David's favorite analogy, how much manure has to go in the brownies before you won't eat them. I don't know why I just keep coming back to that analogy, David, but I do. (laughs) But it's the truth. When we're talking about false prophets, that is the analogy. Spurgeon always talked about it's easy to know the truth from the lie, but the truth from the almost truth. We want to know the difference in the truth from the almost truth. That is is what the children of God do. Devoured by fools. Let's not have that on our tombstones, guys. Mark chapter 12, verses 38 through 40, says, in his teaching, he was saying, this is Jesus, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like respectful greetings in the marketplaces and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets who, what do they do? They devour widows' houses. And for appearance sake, offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. Let me read that again. Who devour widows' houses will receive greater condemnation. The false prophet, he's going to drag a whole lot of people to hell with him. But he will receive greater condemnation. I don't know exactly what that means in hell. We do know that there is more severe punishment for certain people. The false prophets getting the worse punishment than any other sinner who goes to heaven, goes to hell without Christ. Without Christ, everyone will be going to hell. But those who drag others with them are going to be the ones. What Jesus said, it's better to have a millstone around your neck and cast into the sea than for you to cause one of these little ones to stumble. These pseudo-apostolos, these false apostles, they looked good, they sounded good, they tickled ears, they had smooth speech. But just like the Pharisees, they had an appetite for deception. They had an appetite for power. They had an appetite for greed. They drank it up. And who did they feed on once theirs was done? They fed on the widows' houses. They're feeding on the Corinthians here, these immature believers in Corinth, who should be mature by now, but they're not because they haven't been dwelling on Christ, dwelling on the Word. They're fallen prey, devoured by fools. Don't let that be on your tombstone. Amen. Continue in verse 20. Anyone takes advantage of you. Taking advantage, taking advantage of by the fools. What do we say? Smooth speech. Those slick personalities. These things, they had set up camp inside the church at Corinth. Why? Why did they set up camp in there? They had taken advantage of weak doctrine. An all-inclusive doctrine. That they drew no lines. They suffered fools. They didn't want to rock the boat. So they're like, well, come on in. You, you, you name the name of Jesus. There's a whole lot of people who name the name of Jesus who are not born again. Our churches have huge, wide front doors. And we just let people come on in. And then what happens? They sneak out the back door. Because we find out they went out from us. Why? Because they were not of us. Corinth allowed these people to come on in. Why? Because there was no doctrinal fidelity. There was no line to be drawn. We must draw lines. Who's in? Who's out? You affirm the right doctrines, you still might be a false teacher, but you have at least affirmed those right doctrines. We can't read the hearts of men, no. But what we can do is draw a dividing line on doctrine. Over here, you're in. Over here, you're out. I'm not saying anything about where you're sitting today. 
<laughs> the point being, we have a dividing line. And they didn't in Corinth. We must have robust theology. We must have doctrinal statement that says, this is what we believe Scripture says, so that we know who's in and we know who's out. Smooth speech, that got, got them into Corinth. Slick personality, that got them into Corinth. They had taken advantage of weak doctrine. Jason Allen is the president of Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He was preaching at Southern Seminary's chapel this week, and he said a really encouraging thing for the Southern Baptist Convention. He said, I'd rather live in a convention that is overly alarmist regarding doctrinal decline. This is the opposite of what the church is saying today. The church is saying, let's not be such sticklers when it comes to doctrine. Let's not draw these lines. No, Jason Allen is saying the opposite. He's saying, I would rather be in a denomination that does have a little bit, have the radar on a little bit. Maybe they got the, the hair on the back of their neck standing up a little bit when they hear things that may, or, that may be outside of orthodoxy. He's saying, regarding doctrinal decline, I'd rather them be overly alarmist than somebody that's blindly assuming everybody's on the same page. This doctrinal downgrade, that's what we were talking about at the beginning with Spurgeon. That battle in England, that he cost him a lot of friends. But he was on the side of God and doctrinal purity. Amen. Many believe that that stress from that downgrade controversy is really what caused Spurgeon to die at a younger age than he would have because it was so stressful for him. He lost his friends. He lost his denomination. He was kicked out of the Baptist Union in London because he stood on the word of God. Doctrinal purity is of the utmost importance to our great God and Savior. Who is Christ? We need to know who Christ is. What is the gospel? We got to know what the gospel is. We want to be able to proclaim those things to the lost world out there. Amen. Who is Christ? He's the second member of the Godhead. Who is Christ? He's truly God. Who is Christ? He's truly man as well. Who is Christ? He really was born of a virgin. That really does matter. Who is Christ? He really did die on that cross. That matters. Who is Christ? He's the one who raised on the third day. That really matters. Who is Christ? He's the one waiting at the right hand of the Father. That really matters. And he's coming again. As he promised. And guess what? That really matters. These things really matter. Let's back to our text. Verse 20, we're still there. Anyone takes advantage of you, anyone exalts himself. These false brothers, they were lifting themselves up on the backs of their prey. Corinth, lay down. We got to stand on your back so everybody can see us, right? They're lifting themselves up as they're knocking Paul down, as they're knocking the Corinthians down. The Corinthians don't even know they're in sinking sand. Paul brought them the firm foundation of the word of God and who Christ is and what salvation is. Paul brought it to them. But they chose the sinking sand of the false apostles. And those false apostles climbing on their backs, making the Corinthians sink further and further and further and further down. And Paul's coming with a, a rescue rope to pull them out of the sand, to pull them out, to get them back on the firm foundation of the word. That's why Paul wrote the Corinthians these letters. That's why, because he loved them. That's what it says right back up in verse 15. No, I'm sorry, not 15, verse 10. 
Verse 11. Sorry. I'm trying to remember last week's sermons. Why? It says in verse 11, because I do not love you, God knows I do. I knew I preached on that verse last week. It was last week in the morning, not in the evening. Why? Because I do not love you. God knows I do. That's why Paul's rescuing them. He's saying, come on, Corinth. Get back up on the firm foundation. Forget these guys in the sinking sand. Come on back. They're exalting themselves at your expense. They're exalting themselves by dragging my name through the mud. They're exalting themselves by giving you a false gospel with a false Christ. They're picking themselves up to your destruction. Back to verse 20. Anyone exalts himself, anyone hits you in the face. And we might immediately take our minds to Jesus when he said, what, if somebody hits you on the one cheek, turn to him the other. That's not what he's talking about here. That's not what Jesus was talking about either. Jesus was talking about if somebody offends you, so be it. You're going to be offended. You're going to be persecuted. No, this is from within the body of believers, supposedly. These false apostles came in. They're hitting you on the face, Corinth. That ain't from inside. That's from outside. They're hitting you in the face, Corinth. You're taking it, Corinth, aren't you? You're taking that hit to the face. They're punching you right in the mouth, Corinth, and you're not even ducking. It's okay to duck. Amen. When false doctrine comes at you, you better duck. You don't want to catch that stuff. What are they doing here? Anyone hits you in the face. They're dropping nukes on your doctrine, Corinth. And you're just, you're not even flinching. It's like they're throwing confetti on you. No. That's a nuclear bomb, Corinth. You got to know the difference in confetti and a nuke. They're attacking your master, Corinth. That's the big thing. They're attacking your master. They're attacking the character and the name of Jesus Christ when they twist that doctrine of who Christ is. When they twist that doctrine of how you're saved. Wake up, Corinth! Wake up! Stay alert, Corinth! Now to verse 21. To my shame, I must say that we have been weak by comparison. But in whatever respect anyone else is bold, I speak in foolishness. I am just as bold myself. Paul here, he's pitying the fool. I felt like we had to say that at least once if we've used the word fool so many times. He's pitying the fool. Not pity for the fools of the false teachers. No, he's having pity on the Corinthians. Corinth, I'm pitying you. It's a pity, Corinth, that I had to come rattle off so much foolish bragging to, so, to show you what you've been putting up with, Corinth. To show you these fools that you've let in. Corinth! How could you tolerate this? You knew me. You knew the gospel I brought to you. You know the message of Christ. I was there when the church was birthed. How could you let these false teachers come in and lead you away, lead you astray? How can you do it, Corinth? These fools, they're bragging. So you know what? I'm going to do it too. I'm going to brag. And I'm exhausted, Paul says. That's what he's saying here in verse 21. To my shame, I must say that we have been weak by comparison, but in whatever respect anyone else is bold. I speak in foolishness. I am just as bold myself. We're weak in comparison to these guys in our ability to act foolishly. Paul says, no, I'm affected by the truth. Yeah, I've been sarcastic to you guys showing you how you've been listening to these false teachers but i can't do it anymore i'm exhausted i'm exhausted talking like them 
I'm too weak to go on with this foolishness is what Paul says. I'm too weak for that. Corinth, how could you tolerate this? I'm exhausted after only a few sentences of talking like these guys and you've been drug off. Paul can't continue. He feels dirty just talking like these false teachers, talking like these false brethren. He just feels filthy in himself by mimicking them, by mocking them. Just a few lines of playing the fool. Paul feels filthy. He's shown us the foolishness that the Corinth, the Corinthians were putting up with. He's showing us what they were accepting, what they were even partnering with. They were holding hands with the heretics, putting down the true teacher, Paul, putting down the true Messiah that Paul proclaimed, putting down the true gospel that Paul proclaimed. Let's not be the fool, Bass Chapel. Let's be the wise man. Who is the wise man? How does the wise man act? Proverbs chapter 1 tells us. The whole book of Proverbs tells us. Proverbs chapter 1. Let's just start the book out. The first seven verses of Proverbs says, To know wisdom and instruction, to discern the sayings of understanding, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the naive, to the youth, knowledge, and discretion. A wise man will hear an increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. To understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And the end of verse 7. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. How do we know they weren't of us? They went out from us. How do we know they're not of us? They don't adhere to the doctrine taught in the word of God. How do we know they're not of us? Because they were teaching a different Jesus. How do we know they're not of us? Because they're teaching a different gospel. Bass Chapel, are we going to be the wise, like Proverbs chapter 1 here? Or are we going to be the fool? Are we going to dwell on the true Christ of Scripture? Will we treasure the true gospel of Scripture? Will we proclaim the true good news of Scripture? Or what happens Trouble comes when I revert back to my old human ways, right? Trouble comes, let's go back and act like I'm lost again. Trouble comes, worldly line of thought comes, right? Trouble comes, no, we dig deeper in. We rest more in Christ. We trust more in Christ. We don't revert back to our old ways when trouble comes. When the false teacher comes, we don't just follow along blindly. No, we be good Bereans and we compare everything that we're taught to the word of God. Amen. When trouble comes, will you double down on scripture or will you toss it out the window and go back to worldly living? Be wise, Bass. Be wise. Give no foothold for the enemy. Be wise, because why? Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Let's pray. Amen. Father, you are so good that you would send your son who is the ultimate wise man, that his wisdom is shed to us through the pages of Scripture. That our teacher, the Holy Spirit, would increase our knowledge through your word. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy, not just in salvation, but through the process of sanctification. I ask that you would help us to not revert to our old ways, to not chase after false teachers, to not go after things that may tickle the ear, but to double down on our desire to know you and to know your son. 
help us to go through our daily lives. And when trouble comes, when the false teachers come, may we trust all the more in you. And may we know the difference in the lie and the truth and the almost truth. Help us to praise you and to proclaim you. In Jesus' name, amen.